I don't know if I've spent more time this week fixing my sermon or preparing to respond to the lies that Michael Hatcher would tell on me when he introduced me. So when I found out that he was going to introduce me instead, I felt relieved. But then I started thinking, he may just go ahead and lash out at all the, all the things that's been bottled up after these few years. I'm so grateful to be here, and Brother Lee Davis mentioned this morning about being humbled to be asked to speak on this lectureship. I remember shortly after becoming a Christian, after being baptized here, I attended some of the first lectureships, the first lectureships of my life here. And I remember sitting on that second row just looking around in awe of these preachers, thinking about what a command they had of the Scriptures and what a great love they had for the truth. And so now it is a, a humble thing for me to be here speaking on this lectureship. I am eternally indebted to this congregation. If it were not for your holding up the gospel, I would not be a Christian. And so I am indebted to this church. The masses of humanity long for opportunities to begin anew. Husbands and wives who ruined their marriages, parents and children who neglected one another, addicts who destroyed their bodies and minds, and criminals who threw away their freedoms are just a few examples of individuals who see the opportunity to begin anew as a wonderful privilege. Of course, it should be noted that one does not have to be an adulterer or an addict to appreciate the opportunity under consideration. Concerning their former stations in life, many say how they would like the chance to be better spouses, to be better parents, to be better children, to be better employees. Not that they miserably failed at those things before or grievously sinned while fulfilling those positions, but simply that they would enjoy the opportunity to better fulfill those roles. I heard a preacher, again back when I was first considering preaching myself, I heard him say, if I could do it all over again, I would preach. But this time I would do it better. And so there are a lot of individuals who understand the concept and see the concept of starting over as a wonderful thing and as a grand privilege. God's Word presents a plan to mankind that affords him this much longed for opportunity. We understand that the word and the plan of God does not allow one to bypass all of the consequences, earthly consequences of his previous sins. Criminals still have to pay for their crimes. It may be the case that children who were neglected earlier in life cannot be reclaimed. It may be that a body cannot be uh, brought back to complete soundness after it was ravaged with drugs and so forth. We understand that. But at the same time, this, this word does indeed give a person the opportunity. It provides a plan by which man has the chance to have his record cleared in heaven. And while time is still on his side here on earth, he can go out and he can live a better life now and in the future. One better than he did in the past. So again, we understand the concept of starting anew. The, the, the opportunity of beginning again is a wonderful privilege. And we find this opportunity, this concept in 2 Corinthians 5.17. So this afternoon, I would like for us to direct our hearts and our minds to this passage and notice some encouraging things concerning beginning again or starting over. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's encouraging, isn't it? First of all, from this passage, we find encouragement in the universal plea that is at least implied in the passage. Therefore, notice how it starts out. Therefore, if any man. Here we find God's desire for all of humanity. He desires that all men be saved. These words are no doubt reminiscent of the Master's invitation to the masses as recorded in John 
If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And then, of course, there are a host of other passages that go along this same line of thinking. We remember the invitation that Christ gave in, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a wonderful opportunity. And it's extended to the entire world. Of course, those are not the only verses. We think about Acts 10, 34 and 35. God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation. He that feareth Him and worketh righteousness is accepted with Him. What about 2 Peter 3, 9? The Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness. But is long-suffering to us with, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Paul penned in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Think about the numerous events and examples that lend to this encouraging and universal plea of God. We think about the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Notice those two words, all and every. There it is again. The universal plea of God. God wants all men to be saved. Every soul that has been created in His image is a possible recipient of the benefits and the blessings of heaven if he will simply heed the invitation and do as God pleads for him to do. Also, think about various cases of conversions within the New Testament. I think primarily about those individuals to whom Paul was writing this passage from which we are studying this afternoon. You think about the Corinthians. I noted in the lectureship book that by today's standards, the Corinthian congregation was made up of what we might very well call the filth of the world. Looking back on the sins that were enumerated in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, we think, yes, those individuals were definitely sinners prior to their obedience to the gospel. But you, if you think about it, really, even in the minds of their very peers, they were considered to be such. You remember, you've studied uh, the, the background of the letters to the Corinthians. You've noted what they were how they were viewed as far as other people in the world. To Corinthianize meant to, to be immoral, to do immoral things. So even their own peers viewed them as, as low down, we might call them. Think about that church. It was made up of people who were formerly uh, adulterers, fornicators, thieves, drunkards, sodomites. That's quite a contrast, you know that compared to what many congregations are made up of today. But they, as well as anyone, saw the opportunity that the universal nature of God's gospel gave to them. They understood by the plan of redemption, the scheme of redemption, that even as vile and wretched as they had been, those sins could be washed away that the call of the gospel came even to them as bad as they were. Again, if they would only heed it. So the opportunity to begin again, the universal invitation of Christ is seen in the conversion of the Corinthians. Also, think about the writer of this letter from which we are studying. Do you remember how Paul described himself in 1 Timothy 1, 12-16? And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now listen to what he describes himself as. Of whom I am chief. 
Paul says, there was no one worse than me. I was at the very top of the totem pole when it came to bad people and bad blood. That was me. And you notice in another place, he calls, him the, calls himself uh, an apostle born out of due time. He sees himself as very last concerning that. Don't you see that? But he says, there was no one worse than me. Howbeit for this cause, I obtained mercy. This is why... The grace of God was extended to me, he says, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul says, if I can be forgiven, anyone can. I persecuted the church. You remember on one occasion he says that he compelled people to blaspheme, which of course implies that he was successful from time to time. And we know of at least one occasion where a man died, and we think most likely as a result of the commands of Paul, or Saul of Tarsus as he was. And we begin to wonder, you know, maybe the times that he compelled people to blaspheme, do you think perhaps maybe someone was put to death after they blasphemed? at the hands of Paul or Saul. We see throughout the writings of this apostle that he never really got over that, I don't think. He constantly remembered it. And it encouraged him to work harder, I believe, in the kingdom. But when we think about Paul, and we think about the Corinthians, and we think about the nature of the Great Commission, we see that the Gospel provides all people with the opportunity to begin anew. Certainly numerous other examples could be given, but I want to go ahead and, and state this one thing that I noted in the book, that this lays at our feet some very serious responsibilities, some very serious charges. It, it should convict the saved as well as the lost. Concerning the saved, it ought to tell us that we do not need to be prejudiced in our preaching of the gospel. Sometimes we prejudge individuals. And we say, listen, you look at that fellow, he's, he, he's just a bad, bad person. He doesn't care about himself. He doesn't care. Well, maybe he cares too much about himself. He cares about himself, but not his family. He doesn't care about people around him. Look at the way he, he dresses. Look at the way he, he speaks. There's no way that that individual is ever going to listen to the gospel I'm going to overlook that person and go on to someone else. We need to be careful. And we need to make sure that we give others the same opportunity that God has given us. And then also concerning the lost, there is a charge laid at their feet too. Sometimes we hear of individuals saying, there's no possible way that God could ever forgive me. I have been such a sinner. There's no way that my sins will ever be washed away. But then again, we think about Paul, and we think about the Corinthians. So there certainly is a charge laid at the lost feet also. 2 Corinthians 5.17 most definitely provides encouragement by way of the universal plea revealed therein. In the second place, we find encouragement in the designated place that is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5.17, notice how he continues, If any man be in Christ, if any man be in Christ, throughout God's Word, we're aware that there have been several places where God has designated as refuges of safety, places to go where blessings could be provided. In the days of the flood, that place was the ark. During the tenth plague, it was the house with blood on the doorpost. Uh, during the siege of Jericho, it was the house of Rahab. And on and on we could go, but we understand that now in our time, that designated place is in Christ. Think about the fact that outside of this God-appointed place is nothing good. In Ephesians 2, 12, we read how the Ephesians were prior to their conversion without Christ, 
being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, they had no hope and they were without God in the world. It's been correctly pointed out that hope is, is desire plus expectation. They didn't have, they may have desired to be blessed when life on earth was over, but they couldn't expect it. They were groping in darkness, drawing closer and closer to their doom with every passing moment. And that's the case of every individual, whoever reaches the age or the mentality of, of accountability. Every person outside of Christ resides in that place without hope and without God in the world. Every soul outside of Christ is standing on the very brink of hell. Blindly, calmly, and with never a thought or a fear as to his true condition. I remember when I was probably 10 or 11 years old, my grandmother took me to see the country music uh, singer Ronnie Millsap at the UWF Fieldhouse. And I don't remember a whole lot from that concert except this one part where Ronnie Millsap got up from his piano and ran toward the front of the stage. And I was thinking, man, don't you know you're blind? <laughs> I thought he was going to fall off. You know, but he, he had already stepped out how far he could go. He knew where he was. But you know, there are a lot of people who can see physically, but they grope about in blindness spiritually. And they stand at the very brink of the stage, the very brink of hell. And they never know it. And if it were not for the grace of God, Many of us would still be standing there, probably not realizing it. Well, think about what is inside the realm of refuge. That's outside of Christ. Everything that is good and holy, everything that is right and true resides in Christ. You remember the statement that Paul made in Ephesians 1 3 that all spiritual blessings and heavenly places are in Christ. I went through my New Testament and I found several things that are found in Christ. And you've already heard plenty of sermons on these things, but think about them. Romans 3.24, redemption is in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.2, sanctification is in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.19, hope is in Christ. Go back to that idea again of desire plus expectation. You know, I think it's the philosophy of many in the world who at least claim to be Christians... You live, you die, you go to heaven. That's the way things are. That's the natural order of events. That was my thinking before I became a Christian. When I wasn't a skeptic or agnostic, I simply believed, well, you go through life, you, you live a pretty good life, you're a decent person, and, and when you pass from these realms below, you pleasantly awake on the shores of heaven. I never once gave a thought or a consideration to obedience. What does that mean? I'm a good person. I read not too long ago in the newspaper, and this is something that I've, that I've said before, <coughs> Excuse me. that even a person I believe on death row who has committed the most heinous of crimes believes most likely that he's a good person. He simply made a few mistakes in his life, but he's still a good person. And I'm sure that that individual also, most of them, still expect when life is over here that they'll... Uh, that they'll pleasantly awake on the shores of heaven. But they have no hope. They have not obeyed the gospel. But the person in Christ has hope. He has victory, 2 Corinthians 2.14. He has liberty or freedom, Galatians 2.4. Not being without law. He has equality in Christ, Galatians 3.28. He has reconciliation with God. And God's people. Ephesians 2.13. He also has completeness. And, and that, this idea has been alluded to, Barry kind of alluded to it the last hour. We look out into the world and we see a lot of people going about never really satisfied with life. Always looking for some kind of fulfillment and never finding it so long as they reside outside of Christ. But the new creature, the person who is inside Christ, 
in a relationship with deity. He's complete. Ye are complete in Him, Paul told the Colossians. In addition, there is grace, 2 Timothy 2.1, salvation, 2 Timothy 2.10, just to name a few of these. And of course, we want to note that the doorway into this place of heavenly blessings is baptism. Romans 6, 3 and 4, and Galatians 3, 27. We cannot get into Christ without going through the passageway of baptism for the remission of sins. In the third place, we find encouragement in the exalted product that is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Paul continues, he is a new creature when one has accepted the universal invitation of Christ and has thus entered by baptism God's designated place of safety and refuge, he becomes this new creation or new creature of God. This new creature is resurrected. He is one who has been resurrected in spirit. While he was in sin, he was dead on the inside. He was separated from God and everything that God gives from the abundant life that Christ provides. But thanks be to God that hope and life are restored in and by Christ. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Being resurrected in spirit, this person now is renewed in mind. Here is the individual that no longer focuses on the here and the now and the temporal. He is one who is exalted in mind. He has renewed his mind. Romans 12, 2. You remember in Colossians 3, 10 that Paul sought to impress upon the Colossians that they were no longer to be dedicated to the temporal things of this world or to the soul-decaying works of the flesh, but rather they were to put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge or in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. This is the person who has been risen with Christ seeking those things which are above. Well, in addition to these things, this new creature is one who is a reformed creation. He is reformed in character. Think about that. If we were to go through the New Testament and notice some other cases of conversions, we would see individuals who were reformed in character. I listed a number in the book, uh, Simon the Sorcerer, Acts 8, Saul of Tarsus, we've talked about him already, Acts 9, the Philippian Jailer, Acts 16, and of course the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. <coughs> Prior to their becoming new creatures, these individuals, these groups, were involved in sins ranging from witchcraft to persecuting God's people, from injustice to to outrageous or immorality. When they obeyed the gospel, however, they radically reformed their characters. They were new people. They were never the same again. And surely, you can remember back to the time, perhaps, I realize, let me go ahead and state this, I realize that some people are good people before they become Christians. They're upright citizens. They're morally upright. They, they have standards that are correct, but they still reside outside of Christ. They have sinned as all men do, and they stand in need of having those sins washed away. But you know, there were some of us, there are some of us, who were steeped in sin, saturated with worldliness, and separated from God as a result. And if you are of that that class, you have heard people say, you're not who you used to be. Or you've heard of people saying to someone else that you know, <laughs> there's, there's no way. <laughs> a friend of mine, a member here, Tim Lamb, we went to high school together, and he saw someone that, uh, that we went to school with, and uh, this person asked, asked about me, and Tim said, you'd never, you'd never guess what he's doing now. And this person responded probably 25 to life. <laughs> well, I appreciate that vote of confidence. <laughs> but you think about these individuals here, and perhaps individuals here. They've reformed their character. They're no longer the same person. 
there's a line in a song that we sang this morning. I believe the song is I Believe in Jesus 238. And there's this one little phrase that means so much, I think. He's made a difference in me. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? He's made a difference in me. How wonderfully encouraging is 2 Corinthians 5.17 because of its description of the exalted product of those who are in Christ. They are new creatures. They are new in spirit. They are new in mind. And they are new in character. Finally, this afternoon, consider this. We find encouragement in the thrilling potential that is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Paul finishes the phrase or the, the passage. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Here once again pictured for the student of the inspired record is God's wonderful grace and the, transgress the transgressor's unparalleled opportunity. That is, by the mercy of our Heavenly Father, the vilest of sinners can have His record cleared in heaven and have the privilege of beginning anew. Consider also again the contrast between the old and the new. The old person, for example, was a slave to sin. But the new person is a servant of Christ, Romans 6.17. You see, that old person that was enslaved to sin, he was trapped by its deceitful promises. We mentioned the individuals that go through life searching for something that's going to make them happy and were mindful of the book of Ecclesiastes and the experiment that Solomon made. Trying to find completeness and happiness and fulfillment in, in pleasures and power and prestige and possessions and all of these other things. And finally, he comes down to the conclusion and says, the whole of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. You see, that old person was enslaved to sin. He was trapped by its deceitfulness. Sin promises a lot of things. It promises fulfillment and perfection, but it does not deliver. The new person is dead to self. He is in service to the mighty Master. And He is one who enjoys the abundant life that Christ provides. John 10.10 10. There are some contrasts involved there. Also, the old person was careless about spiritual matters. Whereas the new person is absolutely concerned. This old person was careless about God. He didn't care about Him. He was careless about the Christ, the Word. He was careless about his own soul and the souls of others. But some things have changed now. Where he was careless about God, now he seeks first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33 Where the Christ never phased him, now he has as his glorying the cross of Christ. That's the very center of his life. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is the focal point of his life. And as a result of that, this person now is a student and an applier of God's Word. He exalts this book as the product of God. He believes it. He obeys it. He will do anything that he can to teach others. Because now not only is he concerned with his own soul, he's concerned about the souls of others. And when he looks out into the world, he sees the masses of humanity rushing blindly on to eternity unprepared. He's a different person. Quite a contrast from the old person. He's now concerned about these things where he was careless before. Also, the old person focused on the passing things of this life. But the new person has his eyes fixed on heaven and living in such a way as to make it there. We've already heard a sermon from Philippians 3, 13 and 14, but let's notice the passage one more time. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but what this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was no longer concerned with his credentials and the power and prestige that he had in the old law and in his old life. He was a new person. And again, his focus was Christ and the life that he wanted him to live. 
You know, we often we often refer to this thing behind this curtain here as a baptistry. But when we think about 2 Corinthians 5.17, I think that we can see that it is actually a graveyard. Old men, corrupted with sin, concerned only with the temporal things of this life, die to sin and are buried in it. And new persons arise out of it to walk in newness of life, never to be the same again. I want to close with one other passage in mind. It's 2 Peter 1.9. You remember that Peter has given what we sometimes call the Christian graces. And he says that the person who lacks these things, the person who does not add these things continually to his life, he says that he is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. It is so wonderful and so encouraging to be in Christ and knowing that we are new creatures, but you know, it is very easy to become once again entrapped by and caught up in the things of the world. And we can allow these worldly concerns and cares to blind us not only of our heavenly goal, and you see the picture that Peter has painted there, this is an individual that can only see the things right in front of his nose, the things in this life and in this world. But not only will that person who lacks adding these things, not only will he forget about his heavenly goal, he'll forget that he was buried and that he's no longer the same person. Brethren, let's not do that. I try to encourage individuals from time to time to remember the day that they were immersed into Christ. Remember that you put that old person to death and you are no longer the same person. And when we keep those things in mind, when we keep that fact in mind, we're going to do everything that we can in this life to add these necessary ingredients to our lives so that we might focus properly on heaven. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's encouraging to me, and I know that it's encouraging to you.